recording. Okay, we're recording. So we just did a bit of preparation and we weren't sure how to start and Nolan had approached me asking, or at least telling me that, Nolan, you are oscillating between, if I recall correctly, Viveki's ideas and Christianity's ideas. Yeah, that's right. Um, if people saw the uh, conversation with John Verveke and JP, they had a conversation recently, and JP was saying that he's taking a bit of a risk with his kind of Christianity and incorporating that with his kind of philosophical outlook. And the risk is that it might not pan out. But after that, he kind of said, well, Verveke's position seems reasonable. So if this doesn't work out, at least I can kind of fall back onto that rather than falling back and like, you know, complete realistic outlook of the world and that kind of stuff. Now, so I'm kind of in a similar position. I wouldn't say that I've fully committed to Christianity, but it seems on some days it seems a reasonable thing. And on other days, I'm not so sure if I really believe it. Oh, that sounds familiar. Were you raised religiously? Yeah, my mom and my sisters and I used to go to church, but well, they still go to church, but um, my dad never really went to church. And about when I, I'm sure it's a similar story when you're about 10 or 13, somewhere around there. I'm not sure I really believed and eventually quite a while later that I started the church and I haven't been going for about I'm not sure how long but I think probably when I started going to university but after encountering Peterson and some of these more robust versions of Christianity, I realized that I didn't really know what I was talking about. Mm. But you opened up to that. Like, that wasn't painful to you. It was more like, hey, this is interesting. Yeah, I would say so. It's kind of a slow process of encountering Peterson. That was quite interesting. The way it, it kind of, I'm not sure how to describe when I first started hearing him talking. Do you but know it was kind of, uh, it was the first Joe Rogan podcast. That was after I stopped going to university like pretty soon after that I encountered Peterson and that kind of I don't know opened up the world in some sense it was I remember that for its podcast it really it really had an impact on me and I'm not quite sure how to describe it but that kind of opened me back up to the world. Christianity after that started. Uh, I started to see more, more into it, and then it had more depth than I previously thought. And, and were the circumstances of you uh, leaving university? Did that kind of already create that, that you were looking for something? Or because I don't know the story behind that. 
yeah, it was one of those things where it was now what do I do? So I was already kind of in this, I guess you could say, loss. I had to figure out where I was going to go next and what I was going to do. Mm-hmm. For the first while, it was kind of just a relief because I was. University wasn't really manageable the way that I was doing it. It was just, um, I didn't feel like I had a lot of time to do anything. Sorry, could you repeat that? Well, when I left the university before that, uh, it was quite hectic going through all the coursework and that kind of stuff. And I couldn't really keep up with it. And the degree, I had already extended it by one year. So it would have been a five-year thing. And that was still quite difficult to work out the time. Manage the time and that kind of stuff. And I didn't really want to get to years. A good idea to me. So, how that would work, like if I graduated, trying to find a job and manage my condition didn't seem like a viable thing. So, we're doing okay with regards to like the grades and that kind of stuff. That wasn't really the, the issue, but it didn't seem like a viable long term plan. So, and then, so after I left, it was more of just a relief, and I didn't really, it was more of like, a vacation, but because it was really hectic before and then after that, for the first little while, it was just, I wasn't really thinking too much of what I was going to do next. But eventually, it's like with a lot of people, you know, that retire or something, you realize that they kind of have to do something. Yeah. Or else. Yeah, but you weren't rushing with trying to find that. Uh, not at first, but after that, after a while of relaxing, I kind of got bored and realized that, okay, now what am I going to do? Then that kind of coincided with me encountering Peterson. And if that would all started. And then I would say that um, Jonathan Peugeot's work was really the kind of thing that made me see that Christianity wasn't so foolish. Mm. As I had thought. So, but then I'm not still not sure if I this is kind of how I think about it is Christianity seems to be a story that I've encountered but I'm not sure if it's true oh I love that line so that's where it meant sometimes but I, sorry go ahead yeah sometimes i listen to a verbaki lecture or something and that makes a lot of sense to me but then other times it doesn't and so it's kind of like one day i'm a christian and the next day i'm sure <laughs> yeah i know how you're feeling yeah, that, that is difficult because you feel you're ungrounded. 
yeah, it was like a, a cat probably be a solid place to stand. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're adrift. No, I, man, I'm I'm so glad to, that's not the only person struggling with that. It's difficult. So, what keeps you coming to Christianity? I think it's probably the idea of the cross seems to be the get away from. It's, yeah. It's this idea that what do you make of suffering in some of these positions? How does that make sense in the position to make this? So now Vermeke emphasizes a lot of the practices. I'm not really sure what I think there, but. Vermeke seems to kind of come from a, a Buddhism, Buddhist sense, right? Yeah, a little bit. Like you, you detach to, to break the cycle of suffering. I mean, what I love about Christianity is that it's like, okay, our suffering is there, it's just gonna, but you can suffer with others and, and help each other and, and manage your suffering through that. And it's more of an outside as opposed to the Buddhist inside. Now I'm, I'm abstracting, but... It, I, I think that's an interesting difference. Yeah. I don't really know all that much about Buddhism, so I don't really comment on that. But. I, I have to say, Nolan, I, I sometimes have a bit of trouble hearing you. Uh, should I maybe turn the volume up? If, if you can, but sometimes the, your voice kind of drops out and I'm not sure if I need to ask to repeat. Okay, I might be able to change it a bit. But we can keep talking and see how it goes. Is that any different? Yeah, and I've turned my own volume up as well, so. Yeah, because the volume is not very loud. To give the settings, so. So is that good then? Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is better. Thank you. Okay. So, yeah, the thing that kind of keeps me pondering Christianity is this idea of the cross. Mm-hmm also kind of the same thing that keeps me away from it if that makes sense it also with, keeps you away from it is that what you said yeah well with regards well not exactly the cross that keeps me away but probably the problem of evil i would say is the thing that so i guess you could say suffering in general would be the thing but it's also the kind of viewpoint on the world that seems to make the most sense out of suffering so that might be confusing but I would say it's the problem of evil is the main thing that I don't know what to make of In, in that regard, would, how, how do you see that, uh, let's say, Verveke's worldview tackles that? Um, well, I guess the thing is, I'm not really sure. I'm not sure if Verveke really gets into like the specifics of it. But. Mm. The kind of intuition is that 
without some type of being like God. I don't know what to think about suffering if it's just a random coincidence of the way things just happen to work out. Yeah, then it just seems pointless and and that road very quickly leads leads to nihilism i i think either in either in verveke's method or or let's say in verveke's worldview or christianity's worldview what i like about christianity is is, is that it, it would tell you yeah there is suffering and it's terrible and well we actually have in an epistemology that that tells us why but still I know you suffer and I will place my hand on your shoulder and try to alleviate it. So it also is, is Christianity is more of an embodiment of suffering in that regard. Instead of a, instead of a, a, a sort of rational approach to suffering, like suffering exists, therefore we should detach. Suffering exists, therefore we should love the other. Yeah, and for Christianity, it's more about entering into the suffering itself. Yes, yes, as with the cross up there as the example. Yeah. And, like, I think the hard thing about Buddhism and some of these practices is that there's a lot of people who just don't have the ability or the time to invest in learning these techniques. So I'm not sure where they fit in in something like Buddhism. They, the, the laymen would, or lay women for that matter, they would try to follow the for noble truths in the eightfold path, from what I recall, and give alms to the monks, and uh, and, and then then it goes into whole which Buddhism do you follow? Great wheel, small wheel, eh. But in the end, yeah, uh, <laughs> if you don't if you don't become enlightened, if you don't break the cycle, you're basically screwed. And in Christianity, well, we're also screwed. But there's grace, and and grace is for everybody, if you accept it. From what I understand. Yeah, something like that. And and then you you go to church and you. You're together with people who didn't choose you and you didn't choose them and we all and they all suffer but we're together and that's i think that's that, that, that i think that is fundamental to not just suffering but also human existence is that we need to be together and and interacting and that's why for instance this discord and these conversations like you and me are having right now are such a great thing. Yeah, the Discord's really been taken off lately. Isn't it awesome? Yeah, it's kind of given up keeping up with it, but mm -hmm. I try to catch a few things here and there, but overall, it's working out really well. Yeah, we can remember the first good old days where you could still in the morning catch up with everything that had been said the previous day. Not possible anymore. Yeah. So I think oh. that um, if you want to move into that excerpt. Oh, sure. Um, maybe I'll just describe kind of why I think it's important here, but... <laughs> So we've been discussing the problem of evil and 
this excerpt really changed how I was thinking about it. Um, like sometimes I look at suffering and you can see the ways that it kind of can strengthen people and actually be in some ways a good can come out of it in that it can make them a stronger person or as Paul says sometimes stronger but like more compassionate at the same time and but other times I look at suffering in certain situations and I don't see how the how, how that could be good in some way I don't see the good coming from certain types of suffering to could, could, can you repeat the last part? Sorry. Sometimes when you see suffering in the world, there's really no way you can look at it and see the good in it. Like certain situations, say a young child dying from cancer or something. kind of cuts off the rest of their story and doesn't it doesn't even give them a chance to use that to grow into stronger people because they die and then and what you know what comes of that is doesn't seem doesn't seem good to me even though perhaps you can see how perhaps some, I don't know, charity to raise money for cancer or something could arise from a situation like that, but something about it still doesn't seem, seem good in the overview of it. Yeah, well, why did that conscious being need to suffer and die? Why was she sacrificed, basically? Yeah, like, it might be good in something good may come of it, but nothing good came for the person who died from it. No. I, I don't even know if there's, there's an answer to that question that's satisfactory. That just, that's so raw. I mean, we... I don't know if you've seen the, the videos we've been making about uh, Grief Observed. Yeah, I've been watching those. And this kind of led to me thinking about this a bit more. It's just just such raw suffering. There's, there's a book by a uh, Catholic priest from, from uh, the Czech Republic, uh, Tomas Halik or Thomas Malik, yeah, I'm, no, I'm not sure. And he gets a letter, and he gets lots of letters, but he gets a letter from a, a very angry writing man who says, he says, God is a monster with blood in his claws because his granddaughter died of cancer. And what you just said reminded me of that. And the priest writes back to him saying, yeah, I don't know where God is or where God was when your granddaughter died, but I hope you may recognize him in my hand on your shoulder. And I get where the priest is coming from, because how do you possibly explain that? I, I, I don't know. I, I can't know, I think. Yeah, it's something that you can't deal with with the perspective, the limited perspective of our have. So, so I think that um, excerpt that I sent you uh, really addresses this. Do you want to read it? Uh, it's probably better if you read it, but I'm not sure it really solves the problem. Like, there's no really no answer to this problem as far as I can tell. 
is really no way of rationally trying to understand it in some ways. So, but uh, do, do you want to read it so that the listeners or the viewers know what we're referring to? Or, uh, yeah, if you want to read it, that would be great. Uh, I can, sure. Um, it's an excerpt from The Doors of the Sea by David Bentley Hart. In the New York Times this morning, on this the last, hang on. In the New York Times this morning, on this the last day I have set aside for the writing of this book, there appeared a report from Sri Lanka recounting, in part, the story of a large man of enormous physical strength who was unable to prevent four of his five children from perishing in the tsunami and who, as he recited the names of his lost children to the reporter in descending order of age, ending with the name of his four-year-old son, was utterly overwhelmed by his own weeping. Only a moral cretin at the moment would have attempted to soothe his anguish by assuring him that his children had died as a result of God's eternal, inscrutable, and righteousness counsels, and that in fact their deaths had mysteriously served God's purposes in history, and that all of this was completely necessary for God to accomplish his ultimate design in having created this world. Most of us would have the good sense to be ashamed to speak such words. We would recognize that they would offer no more credible comfort than the vaporings of the most idiotically complacent theodicy, and we would detest ourselves for giving voice to odious banalities and blasphemous flippancies. And this should tell us something. For if you would think it shamelessly, shamefully foolish and cruel to say such things in a moment when another sorrow is most real and irresistibly painful, then we ought never to say them. Because what would still our tongues would be the knowledge, which we would possess at the time, though we might forget it later, that such sentiments would amount not only to an indiscretion of words spoken out of season, but to a vile stupidity and a lie told principally for our own comfort, by which we would try to excuse ourselves for believing in an omnipotent and benevolent God. In the process, moreover, we would be attempting to deny that man a knowledge central to the gospel, the knowledge of the evil of death, its intrinsic falsity, its unjust dominion over the world, its ultimate nullity, the knowledge that God is not pleased or nourished by our deaths, that he is not the secret architect of evil, that he is the conqueror of hell, that he has condemned all these things by the power of the cross, the knowledge that God is life and light and infinite love, and that the path that leads through nature and history to his kingdom does not simply follow the contours of either nature of or history, or obey the logic imminent to them, but is open to us by way of the natural and historically, historical absurdity or outrage of the empty tomb. What do you think when you read that, Nolan? Well, it really kind of, before I was kind of thinking about the problem in kind of a uh, utilitarian kind of way where it's like, well, some people might suffer, and but if in the larger picture, um, the overall good that comes from it is less than if that terrible thing were not to happen, then somehow that would make it okay. But the idea that the the ends justify the means, basically, is how I was thinking about it. But I can't really, after reading this part, of thinking of it basically seems awful. It seems like something that I would be able to go back to after reading just kind of refutation in that way. Yeah, I. Just the confrontation with, with such suffering, I, I 
what what David Bentley Hart seems to say is you you in in a lot of words is that you shouldn't use meaningless platitudes or judgments to try to make light of somebody else's horrid experiences or that there's some plan or meaning or point to it all but instead you should focus on what what God did to try to to try to counter it or at least this is so difficult because the cross and the empty tomb were there to conquer death, but they don't conquer suffering. They, they conquer suffering in a potential future. And honestly, I don't believe this, but that, that's something else. I mean, how do you feel about that? Uh, like about the, the empty tomb? It, yeah, the, 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 the cross, the resurrection, I mean, because if that is true, well, yeah, then it's a whole different story. Suffering is still here. And, and we should still try to be there for each other the way Christ was there for the other. But, yeah, if Christ, it's like Paul says, if Christ died on the cross, then our, our faith is in vain. Well, it's kind of back to where I was at the beginning of this conversation where it's well if it is true that's a better story but I don't know if it is true mm -hmm. or I seem to jump back and forth between thinking that it is true and that it isn't true and just to finish that idea kind of off um, I kind of came up with this formulation as a way of thinking of it, but I'm not sure if it, well, I'll just go ahead with it. Um, it's basically this good can come from suffering. Suffering in itself is it's where I met with it. There can be good that comes from suffering, but suffering itself isn't good. If that makes sense. It really depends, I guess. I mean, it kind of reminds me of what Lewis eventually ends up from what I, how I've understood his book. Is he says, well, Yes, she died and she suffered and I suffered because she died. But it also made me realize that I had been blessed by having had a life with her. And then you could say, well, yeah, but then why did she have to die and why did she have to suffer? It, 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 it can't make it more meaningful. It shouldn't make it more meaningful because that means that suffering is necessary to increase the meaning of something and that that doesn't sound right yeah i think the story of lazarus kind of is a good encapsulation of this problem um i might not get the story exactly right but basically Jesus is on his way, I think, to Lazarus. But he dies before he gets there. And then the first person he encounters is Mary, and I think she's the sister of Lazarus. And before Jesus raises him from the dead, um, he starts weeping. And then by the end of the story, T brings him back, and then there's people watching that after seeing this miracle happen, then they believe that Jesus is God. And so it kind of sets up this dichotomy of, well, if Lazarus wouldn't have died, 
then these people wouldn't have seen the miracle and they wouldn't have believed in Jesus. But Jesus also weeps at Lazarus having died. It's this weird kind of paradox. Of. He lets him die. Well, yeah, and then, but he also weeps, which is weird. I mean, that tells me that it wasn't good that he died. It is, it is such a strange story. I mean, Jesus is informed. He waits because he, he from what I understand, he hears Lazarus is sick. He waits. Lazarus dies. And then I, I think, I think it's the, the sister of Lazarus says, why did you, why did you not come earlier? And he, I think he rebukes her with some remark. And then, yeah, he weeps. And, and I don't know who told me this, but like, it's not just weeping, but it's, it's anger and anguish. But that's such a strange story because he can't be raising Lazarus in order to show that he is God. But the story is so interesting. At least there's these little details, like they inform him, oh, Jesus, well, by now, it's going to have to start smelling. So uh, I don't know. You're probably too late. And he still goes ahead. I don't know what to make of it. Yeah. It seems that at some point, uh, rationality just doesn't get you any further. Yeah. This is kind of what um, Nathan Jacobs was talking about, where rationality can get you so far, but eventually you run into something that's mysterious. And we should try as far as we can with rationality, but eventually we're going to hit some type of paradox or mystery that that we can't fully rationalize or understand in that matter. Yeah, and then we, we need to take the, the Kierkegaardian leap in our in our mystery and that, that just accept that we don't understand it. At least that that's what I'll think I'll have to do. Just take the leap and say, okay, I don't know why I'm here or why any of this is here. Or, or why people write poetry, for instance. Like, I've been reading your poetry, and I'm thinking humans are just such interesting beings. Like, we take this thing that we use to indicate where the ripe fruit can be found, and then we do this really interesting thing with it. Like, your poem about uh, the, the Nihilist Cathedral. And... Humans are so interesting. And then you kind of wonder, like, that that's an interesting, strange evolutionary side effect. That's a mystery. That is a that is one of those mysteries. Yeah. Um, maybe I'll do you have anything else you want to add to that? I wanted to ask if you had seen, to go a bit back on the problem of evil, uh, had you seen Paul's video? He made a very recent video on the problem of evil. Uh, I might have. I don't remember, though. From what I recall, he, he kind of, he, he explains that, okay, let's say you, you could, you could just make everything equal and we're going to make sure everything is exactly the way as we think it should be. And then would the world be perfect? No, because you still wouldn't know how to solve this or to solve that. You, you can't oversee the consequences of your actions. There's too much complexity. Sorry, Paul, I'm butchering what you originally said, but it, it, it reminded me a bit of what we've been discussing. Like we, it, it is very hard to do 
anything and know whether it will cause suffering or not. And those are the sins we cannot oversee. And, and that is why I think we need grace, because if we can't see the consequences of our actions, we, that means we cause suffering, whether we like it or not, potentially. And, and that means we are, we are terrible, terrible creatures. And, and for that, we probably need grace. Yeah, because we don't really have the oversight to see how all the small things that we do ripple out into the world and have some big impact. Mm. Is there something else you wanted to talk about? Uh, let me just look. I have a list here of some things that we could talk about. Okay. So, um, recently I read through the Narnia books. And that was one of those things that in many ways was more effective than more effective than these kind of rational arguments to okay to help me kind of understand Christianity at perhaps a different kind of level than the rational arguments. Can you explain? Because Esther's been badgering me to read them. Well, it kind of puts you in the story as opposed to kind of looking at the story from the outside and critiquing it with rational rational like arguments against things that you might encounter and yeah the best part of the books is probably the way that Lewis writes the character of Aslan he has this kind of weird balance of well Aslan isn't exactly your friend and all the characters that encounter him do so with a certain level of anxiety or fear about what might happen if if they if they don't act in the way that is fitting to act towards someone like that, if that makes sense. But then also there's this more compassionate kind of side to the character that comes out here and there. And it's, it's, I imagine it would be a pretty hard thing to pull off getting this kind of balance between these kind of what we sometimes think of as opposites. It kind of, it really does mirror the way that that Christ is portrayed in the Gospels of this kind of weird balance between well, you don't want to mess with him, but But like we mentioned in the story of Lazarus, he falls down weeping. So there's this weird, as Joe would say, he kind of fills the hierarchy rather than simply being at the top of the hierarchy. Now, I haven't read the books. I've only seen the movie. And people tell me the movie isn't as good as the books. Yeah, I watched the movies a long time ago, so I don't really remember them. But, but yeah, the books are worth reading, I think. People have read parts of them to me. Uh, Jeff told me about the, the scene of... Um, 
think it's Lucy, and she encounters Aslan near the river, and she's really thirsty and she wants to drink. Yeah, I think that was actually a jail of one of the other characters. But yeah, that that was an interesting that kind of goes to what I was talking about a few seconds ago. I don't have this lion sitting there by the river and he's obviously very intimidating to this character approaching him. Yeah. And she wants to get a drink from this river and she's like, will you move and let me drink? And he's like, no, I'm just going to sit here. And, and then she says something like, well, do you promise that you're not going to eat me? And then he says, no, if you want to drink, you're going to have to drink with me sitting here just like this. And there's, yeah, there's a few moments like that that kind of stick out. I can't remember any other ones, but it's no, just, but... yeah, there's this interesting balance between yeah, that's really all I would say about that, but. I think they're pretty good books, but there are some moments where it kind of exits the story in some sense, where you kind of notice that the story is referring to something outside itself in some of the more kind of moments that you kind of see the Christianity um, more explicitly. But other than that, I do think it's worth reading. Yeah, and especially passages like, like the one near the river. That seems interesting. Um, I've been reading a biography of Lewis the Narnian, and I'm only like a couple of pages in, but apparently Lewis said that he couldn't really get the stories to form a whole until Aslan came bounding in, as he said, and pulled all the parts together into, into the stories. And that reminds me of when Lewis writes about finding the, the last symphony, or this last symphony of the great peace, that makes all the other music make so much more sense. Yeah. I've warmed up to Lewis, given how dis much I disliked him at first. Yeah. I've been reading this other book as well, um, called Planet Narnia, which is kind of an interesting take. Um, it kind of posits that each of the separate books is meant to kind of showcase the kind of atmosphere of the medieval planets and kind of what they represented. So like the lion and the witch in the wardrobe is meant to be representative of Jupiter, which is kind of this jovial kind of spirit that it goes through. And then it relates this kind of to the, the other parts of the story. Like the fact that the snow goes away and spring comes in and then there's the appearance of like the Santa Claus figure
Yeah, I'm looking this book up and it, Planet Narnia, The Seven Heavens in the Imagination of C.S. Lewis. It got a nomination, the Mythopoeic Scholarship Award in Inkling Studies. Okay. Yeah, it's kind of an interesting book, but I don't know what it, it's an interesting idea, but I don't know if it really makes much of a difference. Symbolism. It, oh, go, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, it's kind of interesting to think how that Lewis might have been thinking about all the stuff while writing the books that you know, are often kind of criticized for their kind of mishmash, kind of all these different parts thrown together, but there is perhaps the theory puts forward that it was more thought out than that. What do you think? Well, given Lewis's kind of personality and his rationality and kind of all these other elements of his character, um, it certainly seems possible that that's what he was doing with the books. That there was this whole symbolic layer underneath that he sort of hid in there. Yeah, and the book also discusses his other books. Um, the, uh, the, the Space Trilogy and some of his poetry. There's definitely a lot of places where he utilizes this um, symbolism of the planets, this other word. So, have you read uh, the Space Trilogy? Um, I started reading some of the first book, but I haven't really gotten around to finishing it. Yeah, I, I know that, that Luke from the Discord is a big fan. Pretty sure Jeff also read them, but yeah, it's just way too many books. And I, I still want to read Doors of the Sea. So I'm glad you you brought up that um, that excerpt because, yeah, that gives me a bit more uh, of an incentive to read it. Though you have to kind of get through David Bentley Hart, he uses lots of words. So, yeah, sometimes he kind of overdoes it with the words. Yeah. I read his other book. I think you read it too, is the, uh, the one where he kind of explains what God is meant to be understood as. I forget what it's called, but. The experience of God. Yeah. And it goes pretty hard at the atheists at the beginning there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he gives them no quarter. So part of me was a little confused when he was trying to achieve with the book. He complains that none of the atheists understand what God is supposed to be, but then he goes the first. I mean, the first few chapters tearing them apart. <laughs> so I'm not sure if he wants them to read it or what. It, it, it certainly helped me get a better grip on some of the arguments I had to deal with as I started to explore mature Christianity, which is I was still stuck in a kind of a new atheist slash internet atheist mindset. And David Bentley Hart kind of showed, no, actually, if you look at the orthodoxy, there's this whole deeper level of philosophy and reasoning. So yeah, I kind of had to poke through his utter disdain for atheists and materialists, but that's a price you pay. Yeah, I don't know why. 
for Reiki is a more interesting figure to me because she at least seems to understand a little bit about the religious and the new atheists don't really seem to it's really kind of embarrassing in some sense that they really don't understand a lot of what they're criticizing so yeah i don't find the new atheists particularly interesting anymore no i i don't even know if i'm an atheist anymore it's just i, I don't know it doesn't feel like it anymore so we're about an hour in nolan is there anything else you want to talk about or you want um not really uh, i'll check my list again but i think we did most of it well i'm i i think this was lots of fun and i'd love to have another conversation with you at some point yeah i enjoyed it too so and i wish you the best of luck with well the, the struggles between trying to figure out where you stand on things and what you believe, but maybe that's just going to go on for another year. I don't know. Yeah. I watched some of your old videos with Paul, so mm. that made me feel not too bad about it. They're quite funny to watch, so. Um. Yeah. No, go ahead. Uh, I was just going to say, you can go ahead. Oh, um, uh, I wanted to ask, is the, are you okay with this one going on YouTube and uh, podcast? Yeah, I'm okay with that. Okay. Well, then I'm going to stop recording. Thank you very much, Nolan. Yeah, I enjoyed it.